It was the day before the children of Israel, slaves in Egypt, were finally set free. For weeks, Moses had appealed to Pharaoh, let my people go, and God through Moses had brought plague after plague after plague to demonstrate his power, to demonstrate that he was God and not Pharaoh. Water turned to blood, gnats, boils, frogs, livestock uh, dying, hail, all kinds of things, darkness over Egypt, but not over the land of Goshen where the children of Israel lived. Time after time, Pharaoh said, no, no, and his heart became hardened. Finally, God, allowed, God announced through, through Moses, the tenth and final plague, what we know is the death of the firstborn. The day before that happened, God gave Moses special command, special instruction. We read about it in Exodus chapter 12 where, where God called his people to do uh, a, a ritual, if you will, every year to commemorate this thing that was about to happen. He gave Moses instruction and then, and then Moses called together the, the people and their leaders and he told them what God had asked them to do. He said, starting this evening and then every year as a memorial for this, I want you to go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in some blood and, and dip it on the top of and both the sides of your door frames. Not one of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and the sides of the door frame and will pass over the doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your house or strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them. It is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. And that's what happened. And that's what the people did. To this day, devout Jews observe the Passover as a very high holy day, a very important ritual to commemorate what God did for their people so many years ago. We come to a ritual here this morning. We call it communion. It's a ritual that's tied in historically very closely to the Jewish Passover. Because like the Passover, this ritual is rooted in historic events. In fact, it was instituted as Jesus and his disciples were gathered around a table to observe what? <laughs> to observe the Passover. And Jesus said, I've, I've been eager to share this Passover meal with you. And then in the context of that Passover, he said, I want to give new meaning to some of these symbols. And from now on, I'm going to ask you, whenever you, you drink this cup, whenever you eat this bread, I'm going to ask you to do it, do it not in remembrance of the deliverance from Egypt, but I'm going to ask you to do it in remembrance of me. And now for nearly 2,000 years, God's church all over this globe, God's church, big and small, in all different languages and in a lot of different forms of just exactly how they go about it. But God's church for nearly 2000 years has been observing this ritual, the bread and the cup, what we call communion. Some traditions use the term Eucharist, maybe other terms, the Lord's Supper. 
We come here today to do not something new, but something very old. <laughs> to share in something that we, we didn't invent, <laughs> we didn't come up with. Something that, that Christ reinterpreted. Something that he instituted and that's been passed down to us. Just as, just as Susan read from the scripture from 1 Corinthians 11, the apostle Paul said, I passed on to you what, what came to me. Paul said he didn't make it up. He said, I'm just passing this on. And so it is passed down to us, generation to generation. And what we do here today, it's in a long line of those who have gone before us. What I'd like to do for just a few moments is to, is to just help remind us of what this is about. I want to talk briefly about, about a few biblical themes. I want to talk about what I see as, as at least part of the significance of the symbols themselves. I want to talk thirdly about a little bit of the contemporary context, how observing the communion seems to, to be used in the context of churches today. And we're going to move fairly quickly through these. As we look at, at the biblical themes, there's really four of them I want to, I want to just highlight. And they come from, from Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians. Some of this we've, we've already read. And Susan shared from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is where Paul said those words. Um, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant or new agreement, new way of connecting with God. This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The first theme, the first biblical theme is, is one of remembrance. And that's really at the heart of what communion is about. It's a picture. It's, it's doing something physical. It's, it's, it's a ritual that God has given us to help us in remembering, to, to bring it in front of us in a way that's not just through our ears or not just reading something, to bring it before us in a way that helps us to remember the death of Christ. But it's not only remembrance, it's also proclamation. It's not just remembering an event in the past, but it's, it's proclaiming. It's proclaiming our faith. It's proclaiming the death of Christ. It's, it's continuing to share that story with others. Jesus said right at the close of that section, for as often as you do this, as often as you, you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Right now we're in this time where, where the events that we remember are, are past, and yet they have implications for the future. That's part of our faith. We have a faith that's in historic events, things that happened in the past, but we have hope for the future. Even beyond this life, we have hope after death. As Joe Beeble lays in a hospital looking at days that are numbered for him, he has a hope. It doesn't mean it's easy to go through this journey, but he has a hope on the other side of death. And he has a faith to know, as others who have gone before him, that it's a win-win. As the Apostle Paul says, if God leads, leads me here, that's... There's benefit there, but, but if God takes me to be with him, that's even better. But we're, we're living in between then, or, or then in the past and then in the future. And in, in this in-between time when we walk by faith, the communion is a way that we, we proclaim in symbol. We proclaim in ritual the story, the message of the death of Christ. So, the biblical themes, remembrance, proclamation. We back up a chapter into 1 Corinthians 10, and, and even though Paul isn't developing this, this whole section entirely about communion, he still keeps bringing it up. And in, in chapter 10, um, particularly verses 16 and 17, he, he gives two other themes, if you will. And he talks about 
a theme of what I would call participation. He says in verse 16, um, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Now, now that's kind of hard to get your mind around. <laughs> but I think it, at, at, its very, at its very basic, it's, it's talking about a, a relationship. It's talking about this is not just a ritual we do that's, that, that's just in our head. It's not just about some academic thing. It's not just to remember events. But as we participate with the communion and as, as it becomes a part of our life, what it represents. We, we are participating with Christ in what he died to accomplish. In the giving of his life, the giving of his body, and the shedding of his blood, we then participate with him as we keep that message alive, as we live that out, as we share that with others, as we become to them, as we give our own lives in various ways, maybe not dying literally, but as we give of ourselves as he gave of himself, to the world around us as we do that in his name that's all part of participating and we we realize that god doesn't call us just to remember he doesn't call us just to proclaim he calls us to participate with him in living in loving the world around us in his name the last theme i would bring up <clears throat> especially from this passage is uh, he goes on to say the very next verse, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. Now I understand in the forms that we do it today, we have bread that's already broken up. Uh, when we have our, our full service of communion twice a year downstairs, we, we have little strips of bread that we break, but the, the image here was initially, as Christ was there sitting around the table with, with his disciples, was that of, of, of a larger loaf that was broken and then passed out to them and they took a piece off. The image here is, is it all comes from one loaf. The symbolism is, is there's a unity here. It doesn't matter what language, it doesn't matter the title over a church door doesn't matter whether it's Catholic or Protestant, whatever the name, whatever the, the brand, whatever the, the association. Other scriptures would bear this out. There's one Christ. There's one body. There's one bread. There's one cup of which we drink. And it was the death of Christ which makes a difference for all of us. As someone has said, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. There's, a, there's an equalizing there as we all come. We all share the same bread, the same drink. We all are equally in need of the mercy and grace of God expressed through Christ. There's a unity there to be had. To be understood. To be embraced. To be lived out. I don't want to suggest those are all the themes. Those are some prominent ones in some of the scriptures which kind of dig in a little bit to the significance, the significance of the communion. But I want us to think before we actually partake today of, of the significance also of, of the symbol. You know, God could have given us any ritual to help us remember, right? He could have asked us to, to fashion two sticks together in the form of a cross and to walk around the building carrying the cross. Would that have been a meaningful symbol? Certainly. I'm sure we could come up with some different things that God could have done, that Christ could have asked his disciples to do in remembrance of him. And I don't presume to know the mind of God in all of these things. But as I reflect on, on why God might have given us food and drink as the symbols of the body and blood of Christ, I think of how God created us, how, how our bodies are designed to live on food. How we need food, we need water, we need drink to survive. And not only that, but once food, once drink comes into our body, it's absorbed into the bloodstream, it feeds the body, it's transported throughout the body. And in some amazing way, the food that we eat, the water, the drink that we take into our bodies ends up nourishing 
every single cell in our body. Let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> Certainly we are amazingly created and designed. Now, sometimes something happens. We've all heard of eating disorders and those can be very serious. Serious because some of them in particular lead a person, sometimes they don't even understand why they're doing it, to, to eat and eat, but as soon as they've eaten, to expel that food from their body before it can even have a chance to nourish them. It's a disorder. It's not functioning the way that it's supposed to function. And that, that food, though taken in, doesn't stay in the body and it can't do its work to nourish the body. I don't know if you can see where I'm headed or not. <laughs> the bread in the cup is not about physical bread and physical drink. Those are the symbols. But I want to suggest that in the same way that food and drink, when, when taken in properly, come into our body and eventually become a part of us down to the very cellular level. That's what God asks us to do with, with what the symbols represent. The truth about Christ, the truth about the death of Christ, the truth that we read together in our responsive reading, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And there were a lot of witnesses who saw him and bore testimony. The truth that God so loved this world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him might not perish but has everlasting life both here and after death. That truth taken into our hearts. God's design is for that not to be left at the church door when we leave. Not to binge and purge but for that truth to become a part of every cell of our being, that it affects everything that we do, every moment of our lives, consciously or unconsciously, subconsciously. And may that be our goal. May that be our goal as we come to the table this morning, that we might remember afresh, that we might proclaim, that we might see our role in participating with God in his work in this world and in the unity with other churches. We're not in competition. Christ draws us together. Lastly, just a few words about the, the contemporary context. I think as we come to the table for many churches, there are three different emphases. One is, one is simply of giving thanks. And that's what the word Eucharist really means. It means I give thanks. And that's very appropriate as we come to the table this morning that we come with that sense of thanksgiving for what God has done for us in Christ. In many churches, it's also a time where, it's, where we encourage to to view this as a, as a reaffirmation of faith. Kind of like a marriage and you come to a vow renewal time or even just the celebration of an anniversary can be that same, I would say, I do all over again. As we celebrate, as we remember, as we reaffirm our commitment to one another. This is a reaffirmation of a faith. Again, a faith which we didn't invent. As Paul says, I passed on what I received. I didn't make it up. I'm just a channel for passing it on to you. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and raised again the third day according to the scriptures. Just as the Old Testament scriptures said would happen. And we place our faith and trust in him. So may it be an opportunity to give thanks. May it be an opportunity to reaffirm our faith. Thirdly, may it be a reaffirmation of of relationship. To understand that faith is not just giving mental assent to something that happened in the past. It's not just giving mental assent to a list of doctrines, but it's our faith in a person. And as we reaffirm our relationship with God through Christ, our relationship with one another as sisters and brothers in the family of Christ, 
All of that is part, is part of what communion represents for us. So that may be a lot to remember all in one moment. But I hope that that will speak to us and help prepare us as we come to the table this morning. We practice what we would consider an open communion here at Indian Creek. We're not policing this. Communion is open to and offered to anyone who professes faith in Jesus Christ.